from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning. Secretary Albright, members of Congress, distinguished guests, I am Jane McAuliffe, director of the John W. Kluge Center. On behalf of the Library of Congress, it is my pleasure to welcome you this morning to a wonderful collaboration undertaken by the Kluge Center, the Embassy of the Czech Republic, and Florida International University, a collaboration to honor the life and legacy of poet, playwright, human rights advocate, and former president of the Czech Republic, Václav Havel, and to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Velvet Revolution. We are pleased and honored to have with us this morning Mr. Lubomir Janečka, the sculptor of the bust of Václav Havel that will be unveiled at the U.S. Capitol this afternoon. As usual, before we begin, please take a moment to silence your mobile phones and electronic devices so that they don't interfere with our speakers. I'll also make you aware that this event is being recorded for placement on the Library of Congress website. To initiate our program, we are pleased to present a short video by Czech filmmaker, screenwriter, and director, Peter Jancharek. Jancharek's career spans journalism, film, and humanitarian work. And he collaborated with Václav Havel in the final decade of Havel's life. This short film has been created especially for this occasion. It reflects on the life's work of this great man. Občanského fóra. Prezident republiky doktor Gustav Husák odstoupí dnes ze své funkce. Naše pokojná revoluce vznikla z odporu studentů a posléze celého národa proti násilí, špíně, intrikám, bezpráví, mafiím, privilegiím a persekucím. Pravda a láska musí zvítězit nad lží a nenávistí. Já jsem spisovatel, kterému to nikdy nedalo a vždycky se angažoval i jako občan. Nikdy jsem po žádné politické funkci netoužil. Zároveň jsem však člověk, který vždycky nadřazoval obecné zájmy nad zájmy vlastní. Kdybych to byl nedělal, nemusel jsem strávit několik let ve vězení a mohl jsem se místo toho věnovat divadlu ve světě. Slibuji vám, že nesklamu vaši důvěru a dovedu tuto zemi ke svobodným volbám. Často slyším otázku, jak nám Spojené státy mohou dnes pomoci. Má odpověď je paradoxní, jako ostatně celý můj život. Nejvíc nám pomůžete, když pomůžete Sovětskému svazu na jeho sice nezvratné, ale přesto nesmírně komplikované cestě k demokracii. Very few actors can can unravel their audiences as quickly as President Havel did with Congress. I thought it was wonderful. Well, 
Varšovská smlouva od dnešního poledne neexistuje. Když jsem řekl na jedné z velkých manifestací, že pravda a láska musí zvítězit nad lží a nenávistí. Dnes bych k tomu rád přidal, že rozum, pokora a odpovědnost musí zvítězit nad krátkozrakostí, píchou a své volí. I think... There are very few people in the world I can think of who have had the journey that Havel has had. From stage technician to playwright to dissident to successful dissident to politician to president to statesman and then back to being an intellectual, being a statesman and an intellectual. And I think it's perhaps the greatest testament to him is that he has been successful in every role on its own terms. Uh, Havel is unique to me, perhaps mostly because through this entire journey, he was able to retain his humanistic core, his liberal core. His vision as a playwright, I think it made him a very good president because he was able to not just understand how to articulate himself, how to express himself, but the, the social implications of everything from what kind of cutlery you use on the table to, uh, you know, um, how to stage uh, an anniversary uh, so that people remember the events. You know, this takes the mind of a playwright, it takes a, a someone with a broader vision. What I do know is that he's a kind person. And I didn't know much about, uh, as it were, I didn't have a direct experience of, of kindness in his life, but I just always felt that in his own way he was a benign and kind person. Uh, so it's something of a miracle that he ended up as president of anything. I think we need the whole world, I think this planet, I think, need such person from time to time. Their voice and their active role for promotion or, or, or for making correction of some of these wrong habits, that I think is important. Your life is something very, very important. You become the source of inspiration. Once I, I told him, I said, I, I, I think you made a mistake to become president. When you were not president, you were the most popular person in, in, in Czechoslovakia or in the Czech Republic, at least the number one, with total allegiance, with total respect from your entire people. Once you become a polit political figure, you have adversaries, maybe even enemies. Why did you do that? And he said, look, I had to do it for the country. I, I, I check and I had to do it for my people in my country. And I understand it. The Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington, deeply regrets that he cannot be with us this morning, but he has sent some remarks. And I will read them now. It is, it is an extraordinary pleasure and privilege for the Library of Congress to be taking part with our Czech friends in this commemoration of Václav Havel and the 25th anniversary of the historic Velvet Revolution. Havel was the central moral force within the peaceful transformation of a great people into freedom. And he became an ecumenical spokesman for human rights throughout the world. He had, be, he had been a prisoner before he became president. And his conscience reached across border lines and cultures in our global era. On his first presidential visit to the United States, I was privileged to turn over to our House and Senate leaders, who in turn gifted to President Havel, the original Czech Declaration of Independence of 1918, which had been in the safekeeping of the Library of Congress 
and was in many ways modeled on the American Declaration of Independence. Václav Havel had a unique connection with the Library of Congress. He twice became a scholar in residence at the library's John W. Kluge Center, conducting research on human rights and authoring both his memoir and his final play. He donated to the library audio recordings of his plays, voiced in his own words, as well as literary works autographed in his own hand. We are honored to host this symposium on an unforgettable humanistic hero of our times. I am particularly sorry not to be able to be with you here this morning, but I look forward to being with you when President Huddle's bust is unveiled in the halls of the U.S. Capitol. I would now like to introduce and to welcome the Minister of Culture of the Czech Republic, Dr. Daniel Herman, who will make some opening remarks. Minister Hermann formerly served as spokesman for the Czech Bishops Conference and as director of the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes. He was elected a member of parliament in 2013. May I welcome to the podium Minister Hermann. Dear Madlenka, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's for me a great pleasure and honor to greet you here. I think that uh, it's a really a great moment. 25 years ago, thanks to Václav Havel, we became a part of the free world. I will tell you a popular joke from the communist time. <laughs> A Czechoslovak president met uh, with, a, with an American president together and they talked to each other. A Czechoslovak leader said, in our country we have uh, freedom of, ex of expression. And his American colleagues replied, okay, and we also have freedom after expression. And that uh, tells all. Uh, I think we find that a quarter century after the collapse of the communist regime, there are still some deep marks in the way we think. And even after the Velvet Revolution, I understood in a better way a great biblical parable of Exodus, of the Jews from Egypt of Pharaohs. Egypt was left by the generation of slaves. And into the promised land entered the new generation of free thinking people. Through or during this uh, journey through the desert came to a generation changed. And this journey through the desert took 40 years under the leadership of Moses. And I think that 25 years after, we are somewhere in the middle. It takes time. And uh, according to me, the role of Moses, more or less three and a half thousand years ago, was very similar to the role of Václav Havel in our modern history. And it's a great pleasure for me that we can be here now and realized that or we are witnessing, really, that the great legacy of Václav Havel is being fulfilled now in this moment. It's really great even for myself. I am happy to deliver my message to a free country and feel that Václav Havel is here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Herman. We're delighted and honored to be able to present a video message from the 43rd President of the United States, President George W. Bush. I'm delighted to congratulate the Czech people on the 25th anniversary of the Velvet Revolution. 
During my presidency, I had the privilege to get to know Václav Havel, the great playwright and former prisoner of conscience who became president of the Czech Republic. My friend helped bring about the return of freedom to his people and led his nation through a remarkable transformation to a vibrant democracy. As democracy pushes further into every corner of the world, it does so on the back of Václav Havel's strong example of intellectual integrity and his refusal to be intimidated by tyranny. His legacy will continue to shape mankind's continuing journey toward liberty and dignity for all. Thank you. I'm very pleased to introduce Ivan Havel, the brother of Václav Havel. A scholar and political activist, Ivan Havel is presently director of the Center for the Theoretical Study, affiliated with Charles University and the Academy of Sciences of the Czech Republic. He is the editor-in-chief of the scientific journal, The Universe, and a member of the Academia Europea, Mr. Havel. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my great pleasure that I was allowed to address you. The only problem is that I do not see you at all because the lights. <laughs> but I imagine that uh, the, the hall is full of people who are interested in my brother. And <laughs> I would like to remind that Moses had also a brother. Of course, you know his name was Aaron. <laughs> uh, I uh, lived with my brother actually all his life, uh, sometimes very closely because when we were children we played together or so. So I know his moods, his uh, times when he was upset, or times when we, he was happy, or everything. And uh, a lot of people asked me. Uh, how he would feel if he were here with us this today and the, these days of the anniversary. And uh, the only thing I can uh, answer is that as I know him, he would not be too much concerned with the official speeches and other events, but he would look for some small absurdity somewhere in corner and amplify it and uh, nicely uh, find in it a symbol of something very important and interesting. I wish you uh, interest in the uh, debate which will follow and uh, I would like to come again sometimes and talk to you again. <laughs> As we turn to the panel discussions planned for this morning, may I invite our first set of distinguished panelists up to the stage. They will speak about the political importance of Václav Havel, and I will say a few words about each one of them. Former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright served in that position from 1997 to 2001. <clears throat> the first woman in the United States in history to be named Secretary of State. <clears throat> Secretary Albright was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia, and immigrated to the United States with her family in 1948. She became a U.S. citizen in 1957 and rose to prominence with a distinguished academic and political career before being appoint, appointed ambassador to the United Nations by President Clinton and then Secretary of State. U.S. Senator John McCain is the senior senator from the state of Arizona. Senator McCain entered the U.S. Naval Academy in June 1954 and served in the U.S. Navy until 1981. He was elected to the House of Representatives from Arizona in 1982 
and elected to the United States Senate in 1986. He is a member and former ranking member of the Senate Committee on Armed Services, member and former chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, member of the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, and member of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. The conversation will be moderated by Michal Jantowski, ambassador of the Czech Republic to the United Kingdom and former ambassador of the Czech Republic to the United States. Ambassador Jantowski formerly served as President Havel's press secretary and political director. We'll allot a few, we will allot a few moments for questions at the end of the conversation, so index cards and pencils will be distributed. Please write your question and hand it to one of the ushers, and we'll address as many of those questions as we are able to in the time available to us. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here with two such uh, distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, uh, the moment I learned that I am to moderate a debate between two of my favorite uh, politicians, but also quite vocal politicians, I realized <laughs> I might be in trouble, so I took the seat nearest to the exit. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> uh, we are to uh, debate the political legacy of uh, Václav Havel, and there are, I will go through several points, and then I will largely leave it to the panelists to choose which of them they want to uh, debate or if they want to debate different points. Some of them are fairly obvious. Of course, uh, the legacy of Václav Havel starts from his defense of uh, human rights. And, uh, but he was not the first politician or dissident who thought about human rights and defending them, of course, but uh, he was one of the first to realize the strategic role of, uh, of human rights in uh, the principle that he advocated uh, of living in truth. He realized that most authoritarian and totalitarian regimes depend on uh, the society living a lie out of fear, out of pressure and oppression, and that the moment an individual uh, resists living in a lie and simply withdraws his ritual support for the regime and stands up in defense of his uh, individual rights, the whole structure of the regime is undermined. The second uh, principle I would mention is uh, the principle of individual and shared responsibility for uh, the fate not of just of our immediate surrounding but of the society in general outside our own country and around the world. The third quite important principle that Havel advocated was the inadmissibility of appeasing the evil. He felt very strongly about that and it's in a way a corollary to the famous Edmund Burke's uh, dictum that you know all it takes for the evil to triumph is for the good people to do uh, nothing. And Havel was uh, decisively refuting to do nothing about, about evil. Now, the less conspicuous points I would mention is, you know, Havel felt that humor in politics is a very important thing. And there are, I'm afraid, too few politicians to, to, uh, to go by that, and, and there, there should be more. Also, defense of language against uh, the contamination of political language of empty phrases and words, etc., etc., was something he felt strongly about in his essay, Words About Words and, and others. And last but not least, he advocated the politics of hope, but it's not the same kind of hope that many politicians talk about. He uh, made it explicit that for him, 
A hope was not a belief that something will turn out well, but uh, the belief that something is meaningful regardless of how it turns out. So that's the moral core of his politics, and I will leave it at that, and uh, we will start with the lady, Madeline. Well, thank you, and I'm delighted to be here. And on a personal note, I'd like to thank the Library of Congress. I wrote my dissertation on the role of the Czechoslovak press in 1968 during the Prague Spring. And none of that could have happened if it hadn't been for the fantastic Slavic collection here. And they had all the newspapers, so I spent an awful lot of time here. And this is a great institution. Thank you very much for, for hosting us. Um, there's so many parts of President Havel's legacy that I think uh, really do need to be examined, uh, not only in terms of what it did at the time, but its relevance to us today. Uh, I, you may wonder what we have in common. We have um, <laughs> many things, but I think the way that we started out our friendship was actually at those elections that in this uh, uh, video they talked about when President Havel said, that the next thing had to be elections. And Senator McCain and I were in Prague for that incredible time, and we were with everybody in uh, the Lucerna singing We Shall Overcome. And, uh, and that is a permanent link for us, and we are great friends, uh, and I think that that is something that really linked us. I think that the part that is so important, any number of things, Michael, that you said, one needs to examine, but. I do think the issue of the role of individual and collective responsibility, uh, because we, at the time, what, and all through his writings, he had talked about the fact that you couldn't just be, a, he talked about the power of the powerless, and that people who felt that they didn't have power actually did, if they exercised their individual responsibility and understood their role within the collective, and that each person had a way of making a difference if they told the truth. And I think that that is something that we have to recognize at this point, and also um, the responsibility of citizens to each other and to their country. And so that is a message that not only certainly resounded at the time, uh, but I think is something very specific today that we, we both know, we all know, in terms of how one as a responsible citizen acts within a democratic society. John? Well, first of all, could I also thank the Library of Congress, but also uh, I'm a great admirer of Secretary Madeleine Albright. Um, to me, she epitomizes many things about America, including people who have come to this country fleeing the conditions under, as they existed and becoming the first female Secretary of State and did a hell of a lot better than most males did. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so. I think you actually voted for me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, as, as Madeline mentioned, uh, that evening of the election it was one of those moments that you just feel so fortunate to be alive and to be there. It was electric. The people jammed in there. The, and also, by the way, I might point out the great affection and respect and recognition that they had for Madeline, who was there uh, that night. So, and, and by the way, she happens to be uh, the chair of a very important organization, the National NDI, and I happen to chair the IRI, and we work a lot together. And human rights uh, in the tradition of President Havel is what we have pursued uh, together. Um, uh, just a couple of comments that from my perspective. One was that I so much admired his strength and courage while in a prison. As you know, I was an involuntary guest of the North Vietnamese for some time. Yeah. <laughs> but it was very different because we were military people. <clears throat> we believed that sooner or later the conflict was going to end, and it was very likely that we would return to our country. Vaclav Havel had no assurance of that when he was thrown into the gulag. He had no belief or a foundation. He had hope for his country and hope for someday that they would achieve freedom, but certainly it wasn't apparent 
when he was uh, incarcerated and interrogated and mistreated. Uh, and yet he came out of that much stronger than when he went in. Um, and, and, and I'd just like to make one other comment also, and that is that, frankly, it is very important for us to celebrate this anniversary because I'm very disturbed about the trend in some countries in Eastern Europe, including, frankly, the Czech Republic. Some of the, some of the things that have been said about Russia, some realignment that's, that's taking place, um, I'm very worried. It's time that we all went back uh, to those principles and those guiding uh, uh, a pursuit of democracy in free and open societies. I look at Hungary today. It's very disturbing. I look at some of the statements by the President of the Czech Republic. I look at some of the things that are going on there and there seems to be some kind of realignment uh, or accommodation with Vladimir Putin who is practicing uh, the czarist ambitions of restoration of the Russian Empire and influence in that region of the world. So I think this is a really opportune time not only to celebrate the legacy of Vaclav Havel, but we ought to start paying attention to what's going on in some of these countries, particularly in Eastern Europe and those that are bordering Russia, not only because of the threat that Vladimir Putin poses to them. I'm particularly talking about the Baltics and Moldova and his continued dismemberment of Ukraine. But I'm also talking about accommodationism that I see taking place in some of these other countries. So it might be worthwhile for all of us to reaffirm our belief and our commitment to the principles that nobody epitomized in a more emphatic and historic fashion than Vaclav Havel. Well, uh, why, why am I not surprised that you went right for the juggler? And, and, <laughs> and, uh, could, I, could I also mention one of the great experiences anyone can have in the world is to walk across the Charles Bridge at sunset. That is one of the yeah. m wonderful I, experiences that anyone can have anywhere on earth. I, I agree with that. And, and, <laughs> and I believe that, you know, we, we all know what you've been talking about and many people have been commenting on this lately and thinking about it lately. But let me pose one question. How much of that is that the countries in question are really thinking about realignment and how much comes from their feeling of being vulnerable, of being left out on a limb, of the uh, Western unity not being what it once was, of the Atlantic bond fraying at the edges and what can we collectively do to, to, uh, to get back to where we want to really be? Well, um, I'm very glad that we are, are looking at the larger picture here. Let me just say, um, and Senator McCain mentioned this obviously, our connection with the National Endowment for Democracy, Carl Gershman is here, and these two institutes that we operate. And I think that the thing that we have learned is that Democracy is not an event, it's a process, and it takes a long time. We have been in this country in existence for quite a long time, and I think there are a few people out there that are somewhat critical of what is going on here. Uh, I, uh, in, when I've been abroad, people have said, so what's the essence of democracy? And I said, it's compromise. And they said, really, like you guys. So um, <laughs> I, I think we have some lessons also. But I do think that what is important to think about, and I obviously, uh, now that I'm not a diplomat, is that um, I'm a political scientist. And I have studied changes in political systems um, in both as an academic and as a practitioner. And I think it's a lot harder than people thought. And we were all there during the euphoria. And 
there are not a lot of countries that have the possibility of having somebody like Václav Havel as president. He really was such a change in every single way, and we'll talk more about that. But then I think it came down to the hard work of how democracy works and what is the relationship between political and economic development and how do people feel comfortable in the country that it exists and how do political parties work and how do people um, organize their voices in order uh, to make sure that change is going on. So I think that um, in all the countries in Central and Eastern Europe, there really has been uh, the facing the reality of how difficult it is to run a country um, in a way where people are feeling responsible to each other and yet exercising their individuality and their rights as individuals. Um, I have to say that um, I am troubled by any number of things that have been happening in Europe. A lot of people think that Americans didn't want a strong European Union. Wrong. We wanted a strong European Union as a partner in order to deal, because we had more in common with each other than anybody else, in order to deal with the issues of the rest of the world and do it in a partnership. The European Union operates on one leg, if at all, and part of the problem is how that works and what is the role of the countries within it, and we could spend a lot of time on that. I do know leg, yeah. that what happened is, because a lot of people came to me, was saying, why is the United States now paying attention to Asia and not paying attention to Europe? Because we need you. And I would say to them, we actually thought you were going to be, you're no longer the problem, you are the solution. And I think that there is kind of mutual disappointment in terms of how we are dealing with each other. I agree with the Senator in terms of uh, what is going on in some of the countries. Real disappointment. You and I have been to Ukraine, we've been to any number of places, and I think people keep looking for how we can fix this, who is responsible, how does democracy work, uh, and I think that's where the ongoing work comes. And I, I do think that the 25th anniversary provides a remarkable opportunity to kind of renew our vows and try to figure out how to help each other uh, get through this very difficult period. Well, I. Th I, I agree with everything that Madeline said, but I think we may be ignoring the elephant in the room or the bear in the room. <laughs> and that is uh, Vladimir Putin, who has made, it's not disguised in the slightest, his ambition to uh, the restoration of Nouveau Russia or, or that old czarist uh, word is. And it has got countries in the region, particularly our Baltic friends, most importantly Mold Moldova, very nervous. We see, we are watching for the first time since the end of World War II, the dismembering of a European country. And what is the United States response? When I tell my constituents back in Arizona that we won't even give weapons, we won't even give weapons or real-time intelligence to the Ukrainian government and military, they're astounded. They're astounded. And now the, the, the absolute avalanche of propaganda coming out of Russia into these countries, the Baltics particularly and others, and directed at, quote, Russian-speaking peoples is incredible. And right now, very frankly, there is almost no response as it was in the old days when we were, when they could, in their basements, turn on their shortwave radio and hear the voice of America. And, and so we watch in the last few days, tanks, artillery pour into Eastern Ukraine. I predicted exactly what he would do. Uh, after Yanukovych left, he had to have, Sevast uh, Putin had to have Sevastopol. He could not give up that, the naval base there. So he was going to take Crimea. I, I predicted. And what did we do? Nothing. Does anybody ever mention the shoot down of a Malaysian airliner? We know who did it. And, and now, according to General Breedlove, the NATO commander, we see an, another movement of troops and tanks and equipment into eastern Ukraine. Now, if you're the president of Estonia, who I, many of us know very well, I'll tell you, 
you are very nervous because you have a significant Russian-speaking population in your country that is being inundated with Russian propaganda. And what's next? I think, I, I, I think that what Vladimir Putin is doing right now, and, and what price has Vladimir Putin paid? Sanctions? By the way, he sanctioned me. I'm sanctioned by Vladimir Putin. You might be a, <laughs> my, I, I view it as a badge of honor, and it didn't hurt me any in Arizona, I'll tell you that. Uh, uh, so, so when you look at the price that Vladimir Putin has paid, then we are seeing great nervousness, including in the Czech Republic, about what this is going to be all about and what's the effect going to be on them. Where does Vladimir Putin stop? And frankly, our European friends, as long as they are dependent on Russian energy, they're not going to do a hell of a lot. A little straight talk, my friend. They haven't and they won't. And Vladimir Putin knows that. So we see statements by the president of the Czech Republic which are remarkable, which are remarkable. And obviously it got kind of a negative reaction from some students in Prague uh, in the last few days. <laughs> Pretty, pretty vigorous. But so the point is that we are, we are now in a situation in history where over time, Russia and Vladimir Putin cannot survive. There, Russia is a gas station masquerading as a country. And the price of, the price of, a, barrel, price of a barrel of oil going down around $70 is, is devastating their economy. Look at the depreciation of the ruble. But at the same time, Look at Vladimir Putin's approval in, in, in Russia itself. And so what do we need to do? We don't need to start World War III. We don't even have to start the Cold War again. But we have to reaffirm the principles of NATO. We have to do what we can to help Ukraine. I was in Maidan with 300,000 people there in sub-freezing weather. The people of Ukraine do not want to be part of the Russian orbit. They want to be part of Europe. And we should be helping them. And not only by providing weapons, but we should be speaking up for them the way that Ronald Reagan spoke up for the Czech people and Václav Havel. Yeah. And we're not doing that. <laughs> well, and we're finally, could I just say, we are not doing that. When is the President of the United States going to condemn uh, Vladimir Putin rather than saying, tell Vladimir that after I'm reelected, I'm going to be more flexible? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm the moderator here, and I'm a diplomat, so you can't expect me to comment on what either of the presidents do. But uh, let me make a historical remark, uh, because it has to do with the legacy of Václav Havel. Uh, when Vladimir Putin was first elected president in 2000, uh, he was for many, he was the darling of the Western world because he, he dressed uh, quite nicely, he spoke passable German, and, and many people saw this was the future of the uh, Russian democracy. There was one person, Václav Havel, who was distrustful from the very beginning of Vladimir Putin and made it quite clear in his writings and in his uh, remarks for him, Putin embodied some of the worst instincts of, uh, of Russian imperial uh, uh, policy and of uh, uh, Russian undemocratic thinking. And uh, he turned out to be uh, largely right. In the meantime, things have happened. Uh, how much do you think uh, the and I know this is awkward, but how much do you think the reset had to do with emboldening uh, Putin to uh, become more assertive? You know, I, I had the privilege of doing something. Um, Putin was named one of the 100 influential people by Time magazine. And then they asked me to, in 750 words, describe what I thought of Putin. And I had a lot of fun with that. Uh, I think. Putin, he's a KGB officer, uh, and I think he's delusional. He has made up his own set of facts, and he is pushing those you were talking about, the propaganda. Uh, and uh, he has done something that I think is part of the danger here. He has identified himself 
with the loss of power by the Soviet Union slash Russia. In 1991, I went and I did surveys all over Europe um, in terms of how countries felt with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Um, I hesitate to say this, but I think that the United States made a mistake in saying that we won the Cold War. They lost the Cold War. And that is not just a semantic difference. The communist system failed. Uh, but it has given Putin an excuse to say that we are the source of all evil and are the ones that have undermined them. We actually are responsible for Ebola and everything. Uh, and so I think, and one of the, the moments during the survey that I will never forget is we were doing a focus group outside Moscow. This man stands up and says, I'm so embarrassed. We used to be a superpower, and now we're Bangladesh with missiles. And one of the things that happened, both for the first Bush administration and for the Clinton administration, was that people felt that we didn't respect the Russians enough. Not true. We did everything we possibly could to work in order to try to bring Russia into the system and respect them, whether it was with the G8 or any number of things. I personally went to see President Yeltsin um, when we were expanding NATO and said, you know, if they got, they, there was a time that if they wanted to um, uh, be able to fulfill the requirements of NATO, there was no reason that Russia could not be a country that was part of the system. A lot of us are blamed for all of this because we expanded NATO. I talked to President Clinton about this and he said, ask a poll or a check how they would feel if we hadn't expanded NATO. So I feel that we have done everything possible to make this, this work. The problem is that the Russians are the man who say we are just Bangladesh with missiles. And what really is part of Putin's attraction and why he does very well is because that, that sense is there. I think uh, that we do need to stand up to Putin. I, I absolutely believe we should do that. I think the question is how we do it, and I think we do it by trying to, in fact, to get back to the theme here, uh, of really trying to, to think about the things that Václav Havel would do or say, and then how he would gather, because among the other things that he did so well, was to gather a community of leaders around him uh, who spent time trying to figure out what the longer term solution is. There is a huge problem here. There is no question. I think that what is happening throughout the world, but certainly in Europe, is very dangerous. And I do think that without getting into political arguments, we do need to do something. And I think the Czechs and the Poles, the Hungarians have lost their mind, not the Hungarians themselves, but Orban, um, have really gone way over. By the way, in this first survey that we also did, one of the questions we asked was, do you believe that there's a piece of your country in the neighboring country? I'll never forget this, 80% Hungarians thought that there was. And so this kind of revanchism that's going on is something that we also have to deal with. Well, I think we're nearing just, a bipartisan consensus. Yeah. Could I just add, make one addition? I agree with everything that Madeline said, but I also think that one of the factors, one of the major factors we learned after the Iron Curtain came down was the effect that things like Radio Free Europe uh, Voice of America, the effect that it had. How many people do we know that after it was over said, I listened to Radio Free Europe. You gave us hope. We listened to the Voice of America. We, 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 we were encouraged when we heard that they were with us. Nathan Shransky talked about how the word spread in the gulag that Ronald Reagan had mentioned his name. Um, so what I think we need to do is how are we how can we best counter this vast propaganda machine that Vladimir Putin has set up? And that is to go back to and emphasize our message, the message of freedom, of democracy, of, of, the, of the legacy of Vaclav Havel. But one of the reasons why we're celebrating him today is because he was in the lead. He's, the, he's what really epitomizes, for many of us who study history, as the cutting edge of what eventually led to the end uh, of the then Soviet empire. So what, uh, in my view, uh, Congress working with the administration should evaluate what we are doing, 
as far as our counter message uh, to the people in Europe and especially in Eastern Europe, including in the uh, Baltic, especially in others, where we would counter the message. The stuff that's coming out of Moscow and these countries are being inundated with is the absolute, it's really like the old communist lies that are just blatant lies, the kind of thing that Lavrov says almost every day. So um, the, uh, I think that we ought to look at that aspect of it. It's not that expensive. And it would be, I think, very important for us to counter this inundation of propaganda that's coming out of Russia today. John, well, one of the things, if I might say, a great term that I've learned uh, recently is what the Russians have done with their propaganda is the militarization of information. And I will work with you to support Radio for Europe and RL because we've got to do that. Amen to that. Uh, Now, we, we promised to have some time for questions from the audience, and here they're coming. So we have quite a few questions and only about five to seven minutes to address them, so I'll consolidate a couple of the questions into Please. one. There are a number of questions about Vaclav Havel's words, his writing, his playwriting, his poetry, his speeches. Um, so to consolidate them into one question, um, one, could you reflect on his words and how his words might be used today to mitigate some of the situations that have been discussed? And two, do you have uh, particular speeches or words of Havel's that resonate most with both of you? Well, I, there are words that stand out. Love, truth, um, responsibility, consciousness. Now, one of the very famous statements during the joint session was that consciousness precedes being. And we all wondered how many people actually understood what he'd said, um, even though everybody thought it was the most brilliant thing. But um, it, I think it's very important because he did talk about that consciousness is the essence of who people have to be and to understand where you exist uh, within the system as being something that is conscious. Uh, because the opposite was the being came first and then consciousness. And I think the fact that he put it in that order, I think, was very important. And of course, the opposite was what the Marxists yeah. advocated, and he refuted that in the Congress. The only thing that I would add that I think was uh, a, a really one of the tools that he had that was very effective was satire. If there's anything that drove the, drove the Soviets crazy, it was when they, with, with the use of satire, and it just was so beautifully done. It was done with a scalpel that uh, it, it uh, and when, when you satirize people that are like the Soviet Union is, it, catch, it, was, it catches on uh, and is repeated time after time. And I think that was one of the very uh, important aspects of his overall message. You've both touched on it a little bit, but we have a question specifically about Voice of America and its role that you see uh, in Europe and the world. Well, I, I think that one of the interesting parts is more towards where we brought public diplomacy within the State Department so that it became part of a tool that could be um, used in a number of ways to refute arguments. What is interesting is Radio for Europe was moved to Prague, which I think was very symbolic. And I do think that it is a way to get um, the message out in, a, in ways that people can listen to it that is not propaganda, that is a way of explaining what is going on in a democracy and not just uh, kind of uh, bellowing facts out uh, so that people know that they are being lied to. The only thing I would add to that, there's been divisions and certainly uh, a great debate uh, particularly in the Senate and in the State Department and in the bureaucracies about sort of what Madeline was talking about. Do we go back to sort of a propaganda, uh, and, and, and I hate to use that word, but sort of a message uh, uh, function, or do we want to be just straight news, or do we, in other words, there is not a, a united, or, um, a uniform approach to the use of Radio Free Europe 
and, and the voice of America, and we're going to have to resolve that. And again, it will cost some money to staff up, which is, by the way, has been drastically reduced, uh, and to get a more perhaps a professional work there in keeping with the new means of communication that we have today, the internet, the tweets, uh, all of the uh, Facebook, all of those make use of all those new methods of that particularly young people use to communicate with each other. That's another thing that we have not done. But we also have to figure out, I think, through congressional hearings and working with the administration as to exactly how we shape that message. Thank you. And unfortunately, we only have time for one more question, so I'll throw three into one question. <laughs> Uh, there's a, a question, a couple of questions about uh, how Havel may have responded to uh, China and other nations um, that are uh, being alleged to have uh, committed human rights abuses. Uh, there's a couple of questions about NATO and uh, its role, um, and a very interesting question um, about leadership and how do we um, build and, uh, and generate new leaders um, for the world. Uh, in the spirit and the vein of the Vaclav Havels. So where will the next generation of Havels come from? So um, take a crack at any of those three. Um, well, let me just say, I do think that what was among the many important parts about Václav Havel was that he spoke out about what was uh, not only wrong in his own country, but used his moral authority to be the spokesperson for human rights. And he uh, aligned himself with people that were fighting within their own countries. Um, he certainly did with what was going on in China. At a certain time, he did with Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, she, he, I, I know her well, and she is very grateful for the kinds of things that, that President Havel did in, in support of her. I think there was not a time that he did not speak out about um, some derogation of human rights anywhere in the world, and I do think that we should be doing more with that. And then I do also believe that that is where a new generation of leaders come from, who understand that whatever principles one has for one's own country um, are derived from your own culture, but that we are all the same, which is what Václav Havel believed, and that we can help each other in our various countries, and that's where leaders come from. You know, I The fact that we are celebrating him today is, I think, another testimony to his enduring legacy. When historians look back at the 20th century, I think they will look at the role that he played as a very important factor in bringing about a fundamental change uh, in Europe. And I think one of the lessons we can learn from that is it isn't necessarily the force of arms that change history. It's the voice of reason. It's the willingness to sacrifice. And God knows he sacrificed uh, uh, for the principles and things that you believe in and stand for. And that there's one universal principle that all of us should never forget, and that is human rights. That all of us, no matter where we are from, no matter what part of the world, no matter what kind of regime exists, that human rights are universal. And if there was a message that I got from Václav Havel, is exactly that, that the people who are living in the most remote part of the world's and world in the most difficult circumstances are entitled to the same future that those of us in more advanced countries are able to enjoy. And if we stop doing that, if we stop advocating for them, then we will have abandon the fundamental principles that were so eloquently articulated by Václav Havel. If I might say one more thing, we were talking about the Old Testament and Moses. In the New Testament, it does say that a prophet is not often respected in his own country. We all respect Václav Havel here and are celebrating him, and I think the most respectful and truthful way, and I wish that the people of the Czech Republic understood what an incredible legacy he left for those of us that were born there, that were proud of being born there, and that need to be respected in the Czech Republic today.
John. John. Uh, Madeline, let me assure you that many people back home do. Uh, but before we conclude, this was wonderful. Uh, I have a small ceremony to conduct, and I will start with John. John, you're a military man, so you know what a challenge coin is. So I have a challenge coin here for you as Thank a you. token of our appreciation from the Czech Embassy in Washington. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Madeleine, uh, you've been a Secretary of State, you've been famous for your pins, which you used <laughs> as tools of foreign policy and symbolic statements and sometimes as weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, we have a Czech jeweler here, Mr. Alois Rishavi, who made a special pin for you and would like to present it to you here. So, please. This is Mr. Shari. Oh, great. oh, it's beautiful. That's terrific. A Czech lion. Oh, it's beautiful. Okay, beautiful. Very beautiful. Can I, yeah. Shall we try to pin it on you? Yeah. Okay, that's okay. This is definitely many pins. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And Thank you very much. It's beautiful. Thank, Thank you, John. I have to just Thank, Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, my dear. It's great to see you. Adeline, I get a hug, too. What a wonderful panel. We are very fortunate. I now invite our second panel to the stage, and as they're coming forward, we will screen a short excerpt of Václav Havel's memorable address, The Emperor Has No Clothes, which was delivered at the Library of Congress. As Dr. Billington's <laughs> remarks have reminded us, Václav Havel was twice a scholar in residence at the library's John W. Kluge Center. During those periods, he worked on his final play, Leaving, and on his memoir, To the Castle and Back. Havel also presented two lectures at the library during his Kluge residencies. His May 2005 lecture on human rights, The Emperor Has No Clothes, addressed the contradiction between what nations proclaim about human rights and how they actually treat their citizens. In February 2007, during his second residency, Havel conducted a forum on dissidents and freedom, featuring eight human rights activists from around the world. Here is a portion of Havel's 2005 address, delivered on this very stage nine years ago. Dear friends, <coughs> During my first presidential visit to United States more than 15 years ago, <clears throat> I received here in Washington, on behalf of my country, an important gift. It was the original manuscript of the Czechoslovakian Declaration of Independence from the year 1918. This rare and valuable document had, until 1990, been the property of this library. It was handwritten in Czech by our first president, Thomas Garik Masaryk, who deserves a great deal of credit for the, for the creation of an independent Czechoslovakia and who when he was in exile in the United States, worked closely with President Wilson. It is highly likely that in writing this declaration, Masaryk was inspired by the American Declaration of Independence. 
There are several such documents in modern history that have had a significance similar to that enjoyed to this day by the American Declaration of Independence. I need only mention, for instance, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted after World War II by the United Nations, or the final act of the Helsinki Conference in 1985. <clears throat> These documents are so much more successful for having been written in simple, clear, eloquent language, if only because that makes it easier for school children to learn them and take them to heart so they become a permanent part of their civic understanding and their system of values. <clears throat> Along with the precision and the elegance of such basic documents, of course, there is one other thing that plays an immensely important role. There must, be, there must be people who are willing, as they say, to put themselves on the line for these documents. That is, these declarations must be taken seriously, their general principles must be made specific, they must be made genuinely binding, and their fulfillment must be a tangible thing. <coughs> Unfortunately, <coughs> there are regimes or governments in the world who make a great show of, of floating these papers, yet clearly do not take them seriously. For such regimes, these declarations are merely one of the loftier aspects of a formal ritual that has a single purpose, to disguise a miserable ra reality. Their function is similar to the function of many celebrations, flag waving, parades, demonstrations, or celebratory proclamations or speeches, not to reveal truth, but to hide it. What may rightly and properly be done about it? <coughs> Certainly, such manipulation with words, texts, declarations, constitutions, or laws should not be met with merely private ridicule or resistance. There is another way, one that is riskier, yet more productive. It may not be universally applicable, but it has proven effective in most cases, especially in the modern world with its unders uh, unprecedented concentration of power and the unprecedented influence of falsely used words. <coughs> that way consists in a persistent effort to take those who invoke those declarations at their word and to demand that their words amount to more than hollow sound. Such an approach usually provokes great astonishment and anger in rulers who are used to no one taking them at their word and to no one having the courage to appeal to the real meaning of their words. But that is only to be expected. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.